All right. <laughs> Welcome to History from the Road and Between the Pages. Okay. Um, thank you for participating in 1455 Second Annual Summer Literary Festival. We hope you will help us spread awareness by sharing your impressions via social media, liking the 1455 Facebook page, and signing up for our newsletter. We also hope you'll dig deeper into the work of our authors. Their books are available for purchase via the links on our agenda page of the Lit Fest website. All purchases will be shipped directly to your door. 1455 is delighted to be partnering with the Potter's House on book sales this year. They're a nonprofit bookstore, cafe, and event space in Washington, DC with a deep history of social justice and community building. Learn more about their work at um, potterhousedc.org. All right, without further ado, um, we panelists will introduce ourselves. And as a reminder, um, we hope to make the session, this session as interactive as possible. So please use the chat room to submit questions and we'll do our very best to answer them. So thank you for coming and enjoy. And I'll turn it over to Karen to introduce herself. Hi, good, it's afternoon already. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Karen A. Chase. I am the author of Caring Independence, which is the big poster behind me and also this book. Uh, it was my first work of fiction. I'm also the author of Bonjour 40. Uh, I turned 40, went to Paris for my 40th for 40 days, and that became a book. And I am currently on track to write a couple more. I'm a full-time writer at this point. I have a background in marketing and design, and you can find me at karenachase.com. Jada. Hi, I'm <laughs> Jada. Yeah. I'm Jada Justice, and I write at the blog, The History Mom, where I help parents plan educational vacations with their kids, and I live in Richmond, Virginia, and I'm originally from the historic town of Kings Mountain, North Carolina. Libby, you want to go ahead? Sure. My name is Libby McNamee, and I am the author of Susanna's Midnight Ride which is my first public book of fiction. And it's based on the true story of a girl from Hopewell, Virginia, who saved General Lafayette from capture during the American Revolution. And I'm currently working in a second book on Dolly Madison in the War of 1812. And I am a full-fledged his history geek, like my friends on this panel. <laughs> and I also have a website, libbymacnamee.com, and um, Facebook author page, um, Libby McNamee Author. And the usual, the other usual stalking social media addresses as well. So thank you very much. Now our first topic is going to be our favorite research tips. And what we're going to try to do is do a little bit of a tag team where, Ameri uh, where Karen talks about the American Revolution, I talk about the War of 1812, and Jada will talk about the Civil War. And then we will all perhaps interrupt each other a little bit. So I'll turn it over to you, Karen. And we're going to have Q&A at the end. You should have a little Q&A button at the bottom or at the top of your screen. If you'll put your Q&A in there and uh, Libby and I will try to watch that and make sure that we answer those questions at the end. Um, so the first topic really is favorite research tips. And um, mine is always that you've got to remember that the best helpers in the world are people. Um, so often I would read a book by an academic or an historian and then I'd get all really antsy about whether or not I should reach out to them and actually communicate with these people because they have a book out, I don't yet. Um, and 99 times out of 100, they were so gracious in terms of helping me with my book. But my tip for that is, of course, that if that person, if they are not, let's say, docent at a museum, but they're a person who has a book out that you read the book first so that you make sure you have pretty eloquent questions by the time you connect with them. And I always try to connect with them via email first so that I can really get my question very succinctly put out in case they don't have time. Um, but I also offer to get on a phone call with them or to come visit if I plan if I'm planning a research trip. So the, the people have really been my biggest um, source of help in creating caring independence. For instance, um, I have a Shawnee character and I wanted to communicate with someone that knew a lot more about Native American history than I did. And I was introduced to Colin Calloway at Dartmouth. And 
he and I ended up on the phone for over an hour. I had very specific questions, of course, but he ended up pulling other books from his bookshelf and sending them to me. Um, so, but when you're working with those people, I would say read what they have produced first or read the website if they're a museum docent. Once you are done being in contact with them and you have your questions, make sure you record who they are and where they're from because later on they're going to be a wonderful source for you for possibly a blurb for your book or things like that. Uh, and then my only other tip is don't forget the DAR. I'm a daughter of the American Revolution and we have um, in the state of Virginia alone, which is where I am, we have uh, a thousand DAR members and a hundred DAR chapters. Um, I'm sorry, 9,000 members and 100 DAR chapters. And whenever you look at historic places, there's usually a DAR chapter in that area. And they're wonderful people to reach out to because they automatically know the uh, Revolutionary War sites in your area. And they can probably get you behind the scenes tours and things like that. So reach out to your daughters in the American Revolution chapters wherever you go. Jada, do you want to take the Civil War? Oh. I think uh, Jane, sure. Right. Libby, do you want to do 1812 first? Am I breaking up? Okay. Uh -huh. Libby, why don't you go ahead? Okay, and then sure. I'm going to move um, um, Echoing what Karen said is um, don't be shy about tackling an area of history that you don't know anything about. And I've done that now twice, really, with the American Revolution and with the War of 1812. And what I started with, I started with children's books. Um, this is a book about Dolly Madison that I read. And um, I mean, it, um, life on a plantation that gave me a map of a plantation I, and Wikipedia. Um, so don't be, don't be embarrassed to start early and start with the basics and build on that. And a lot of times too, I just, I do a lot of just internet research. And then what I try to do is save a PDF of it and put it in a folder because invariably, you know, a year down the line, I want to read even though I've taken what I think I want out of it, a lot of times I want to read it over again. So saving that so you remember where it all came from later on when you're trying to give credit to people is really helpful. And the other thing is, like what Karen said, is people are definitely your best resource. And I regret also with my book that I was so shy because it was my first book and I didn't really want to tell anyone that I was writing it. I felt kind of like a fraud. And um, I really wish I had reached out to people in the area. And it was amazing in, in my book, um, Susanna makes her midnight ride to a place called the halfway house that back then was the only lodging place between Richmond and Petersburg. And it's still open today. And you know, they use the same kitchen and all that. And right after I published the book, I contacted the owner and immediately he became like my surrogate father and like adopted me. And I really wish that I had asked him for information before. And I wish I had gone to the local historical societies. I mean, they are just a gold mine of people who are interested. And like Karen was saying, is these people write these books there and they're a labor of love and they are so happy to know that someone's reading them. Um, so that's really just been a wonderful surprise of how welcoming the history community is. And they, they want people to learn more and they, you know, there's no snobbery involved. And reenactors are amazing. I've gone to all these reenactments and become friends with them. And I even had a reenactor, she um, made a video for me of running her spinning wheel so I could hear the sound that it makes so I could extrapolate it of what would that sound be like on a town square. And she was so happy to do it. She was so happy that someone was interested. So, um, you know, kind of put your ego at the door and just reach out to people and um, you'll be amazed at the results you get. So how about you, Jada? Yes, I kind of feel the same way as I'm working on my first book. I've reached out to a lot of the National Park Rangers because with the Civil War, we still have a lot of the battlefields preserved. And so those Civil War um, Rangers are, they have are a wealth of knowledge. And in Richmond, we're especially blessed to have so many amazing Rangers and um, one in particular, Mike Gorman, has some, you know, vast knowledge of the Civil War. When I told him what I was working on, he pulled up on his computer pictures that weren't available really anywhere to be able to um, show me about the house um, that in question. So those, um, those National Park Service Rangers are great. And then also, I want to recommend looking at diaries from the time period that are published. I found a lot of information 
from Civil War diaries, especially about from women who are key note takers of the time. Um, so I really, and you really get a little sense about the, the actual time period and what the real life was like while maybe some battles are being fought, real life was still happening. So I found women's diaries to be a great, great thing to, to read. Okay, so our next question is our favorite locations. So how about you, Karen? How are you gonna be able to narrow this down? I can't wait to hear. <laughs> you know, it is tough because I went to every location in my book. And so I, I'm in love with a lot of them after being at them. A few of them I discount because I think they got the history wrong actually um, upon further research. So I'm not including those, but I've split it into a couple things. So my first recommendation of course, is to go to some of the different societies that are out there to do your research for this time period especially. The American Antiquarian Society was one of my favorites in part because I got a month long fellowship to study there. But they're in Worcester, Massachusetts and they have 19th century history and earlier in their archives. They even have like a little bottle of tea that was scooped out of the harbor in Boston that they have in their archives. So, I mean, they have really a wonderful collection beyond just books and literature and manuscripts. Um, and same with the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia. The David Library was a big library of American revolutionary history and they've merged with the American Philosophical Society and moved most of their archives under that umbrella. And what I like about those two locations also, and I kind of, you know, this is a great research tip for our later section too, but they have um, fellowship housing that you can stay in for like just a few hundred bucks a week. And when fellows are not staying in it, they open them up to other researchers. So if you know what time you're gonna go, when you try to go in a season where the academics are not there for summer, you can stay for like 400 bucks a week, which in Philadelphia, that's a tremendous savings versus a hotel that I wish I'd known about more. Um, but as far as like really cool places, um, I love Yorktown here in Virginia. It's one of my favorites to go to. I think Colonial Williamsburg has lately too often become an amusement park instead of a good historic location. And Yorktown has pretty much stayed true to that, which I really love about it. And everyone's so happy that someone's come to Yorktown that they're eager to show you everything. But then further north, because my book went all the way up into New York and Connecticut, uh, up in Harlem, there is the original house that was George Washington's headquarters during the American Revolution, and it still stands. It's 11 miles up from the base of Manhattan, which back then was nothing but farmland in between. But it's right in the middle of Harlem. It's totally preserved. Um, and it's, it's also for the Hamilton fans in the group. It's where he and his wife stayed for a little while too. They lived in the, it's the Morris Jumel Mansion is the name of it now. Um, but it's one of my favorites. So those, those are some of them. And then I'm always a big proponent of calling up and, and visiting historical societies in different locations. Virginia is now called the Museum of History and Culture, but the historical societies can be really good, but don't discount local libraries. When I was up in Litchfield, Connecticut, it was the local librarian uh, who had all the lore and all the knowledge about the history of the town more. Um, and they also had transcribed letters from one of the founders for my book. So, I mean, it was really, the local libraries sometimes have a lot more local history in them than you'd expect. Okay. Um, but, but, let me go to War of 1812 go sequentially. Um, I did a lot of exploring last summer. Thank God I did it then in um, Washington, D.C., which back then they called the, um, was Washington City or Federal City. And um, I got to visit the Octagon House, which is now the National Institute for Architects, but they open a couple days a week for tours. And that was just amazing. And that's where Dolly and Jemmy moved after the White House burned and conducted their um, drawing rooms. And that's actually where James Madison signed the Treaty of Ghent upstairs in the, um, his study right above the entryway. So it's a really neat house and it's just about a block from the White House. So I loved visiting there. And um, there's a neat place called Riversdale and it's in Bladensburg, Maryland, which back then used to be the place to be in the whole Washington area. And there was a family that 
moved to Bladensburg from Belgium to escape the terror that was bleeding over from France. And they were some of the richest people in Europe and they brought the biggest art collection that the United States has ever had. They brought it with them and built this house and it's called Riversdale. So Rosalie, the daughter, ended up marrying one of the Lord Calverts who are basically, you know, royalty from Baltimore. She married one of them and stayed. So she wrote these incredible letters back and forth with her father, basically running this farm. And she was very advanced for her um, time period, very savvy. And um, I especially like her because she hated Dolly Madison and she was very vocal about it. So, you know, when you're writing a book, you, especially a novel, you've got to have, you got to have the frenemy. So she's the perfect frenemy that she would show up at these parlors and then she'd make all these disparaging comments and um, call her Queen Dala Lala and um, Thomas Jefferson was Tommy Jeff and all that. So um, I loved visiting her house and that's one of those places where Nobody's heard of Bladensburg. It really is, you know, it's um, just past like Anacostia. So it's not in a great neighborhood now. So when you go visit there, they are so excited that you're there. So that's a really neat place that I lived in DC for seven, eight years and I had never even heard of it. I lived on Capitol Hill. Um, and um, there's another place that actually is just more amusing than anything else, but Fort Washington, and it was called Fort Warburton then. And it's by National Harbor. And um, this is hilarious. They had built this entire fort there so that they could prevent the British from going up river because it's right where the Potomac starts. And the commander there saw the British coming, totally freaked out, blew up the whole place and ran away. And uh, my son still laughs about it because in the National Park video there, of course we were the only ones there and honest to God, the guy who worked there was asleep when we banged on the door because nobody ever visits. But even in the National Park video, they talk about how nothing has ever happened there. So that was just hilarious. And then we ended up going to Mount Vernon because I had to drop off some books. So it was just hilarious going from there and then going to Mount Vernon, you know, one extreme to the other. So, um, it, you know, the, the quirky people you meet, um, I think I've probably told both of you the story about the, the most territorial librarian I have ever encountered at the, um, there's a DAR for the War of 1812 and their national headquarters is in Washington, D.C. And, um, Man, it was it was like a battle of the wills to get to look at those books. And then she informed me that I was not allowed to reshelve them because I was going to get them out of order. So I did reshelve one, but I put it back in the right place. But I was tempted to misshelve it, but I didn't. So anyway, um, it's just hilarious how you, it brings it alive meeting just to all the people that you meet really make this, all the research so much more fun. So Jada, how about you? Well, with the Civil War, there's just so many, you know, there's so many locations that we could visit. Um, and luckily, living here in Virginia, a lot of them are very close by. But um, I really recommend for someone starting out researching, thinking about writing a book or, or researching more about the Civil War, really starting with kind of the beginning and the end, going to Fort Sumter, seeing, uh, touring Fort Sumter, seeing the, the town of Charleston and hearing the stories there, and then coming to Appomattox, and then trying to put the, your story in between those two, but I really think it's important to see both the beginning, where it began, and where it kind of technically ended, but it still continued after, a little bit after that, but um, that was what we consider as where it ended. So those are two very important sites to visit, and plus Charleston is so amazing to visit um, for history anyway. And then I also recommend going here in Richmond to the American Civil War Museum that just reopened a few years ago. It combined um, two museums into one and they've done an amazing job in their new museum of providing different perspectives. So for me, you know, sometimes battles can get kind of boring or you hear the same stories over and over again about battles, but the museum does a great job of bringing in women's stories. What were the women doing in the home front when these men were all fighting battles, um, especially in Vicksburg or in Richmond? There's some amazing and heartbreaking stories that were happening um, while the men were all fighting these battles. And they also bring in other perspectives from the enslaved um, people's um, vision back then and what was happening to them. So I think that museum does a really great job of not just focusing on the battles, but bringing in the people. And then my favorite place, if you're wanting to get kind of an overview of battle and museum and home life, um, Pamplin Park down um, southwest of Petersburg is a great 
kind of one-stop shop for that because there's a museum about soldiers and there's a battlefield, but there's also a homestead and you can see what houses were like and what um, the folks who lived in these houses, what they were going through while the war was literally on their front doorstep. So those are some great starting points um, at locations. That's great. Those sound, that's fascinating. Um, now we're going to move on to virtual travel tips. Karen? Yeah, we, we all want, would re much rather be doing regular travel right now. I mean, I don't know about you two, but I'm completely jonesing for being on the road and doing research um, in part. And I'm just going to add this as just when we do get back to traveling, my, my biggest tip is I have a, a little worksheet that I take with me. And, and it's, um, it's got the name of the location and any contacts that I have on it. And then it has little boxes next to each of the five senses. So I can make sure that I'm not just recording the history or I'm not just recording like where I am geographically, but what it smells like. And if I end up eating anything, like um, I went to Stratford Hall one time and I ended up like pinching this tomato from the back garden. And it does taste different when you eat a tomato straight off the vine, especially a stolen one. Um, <laughs> I later confessed to them that I did eat it. But having those different senses for, for me, because I'm a, a novelist in the historical time period, that in the revolutionary era, I want to make sure that I'm giving the flavors and the smells. And I love including food in my books. So that's a big part of it, too. Um, and as far as, you know, your vicarious travel at this point, that is one of the things that I recommend doing. There are some wonderful books about cooking in the revolutionary period, and most of them come from Chef Stabe, Walter Stabe. He is the chef at City Tavern in Philadelphia, and he's, he's got some wonderful taste of history videos that he's done online where he's actually cooking in like the open hearth with the old pots and everything, and he's trying to a little bit with some of the modern food options recreate these historic recipes and so that's something that you can do at home now in terms of researching the food from the time period um, the other thing i know a lot of us have zoom fatigue um, it's funny to say well we're all on one but actually exactly. we do have some zoom fatigue from from being on this uh, but one of the things I recommend, you know, I have my standard things that I belong to here in Richmond and they're having a lot of Zoom sessions, but pretty quickly afterward, it occurred to me that I could attend Zoom sessions far away in places and see presentations that I wouldn't normally see. And even like the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, they have great Zoom meetings. And so I watched a woman from Charlottesville give a presentation at the American Philosophical Society on the history of Jefferson's portraits and how they were created and what was in them and why he was wearing what he was wearing. So I would recommend like reaching out to some of these groups that are far away from you. You know, for me, that's locations like for my next book in Charleston um, and seeing what different presentations they have online rather than going back to the same group you always meet with. It's wonderful to see the people that you know and that you love in your region, but I think seeing people far away is really um, important. It's an opportunity even to look at some of the, um, like the British Museum and things like that, look at some of their Zoom sessions that you wouldn't normally look at, especially for this time period, for the revolutionary period. And then one of my favorite online resources, this is part research trip, but part vicarious travel, is David Rumsey's map collection online. Um, it's really hard when you're writing in a faraway time period to understand what roads and things look like. And David Rumsey has this wonderful collection of historic maps. You can do find very specific maps. Even if you're not writing in any of the war American war time periods that we're writing in, let's say you're you're working on Spanish wars or things like that, you can look up all of these antique maps and David Rumsey's has what he calls the georeferencer on his website. And it overlays the old historic map with the brand new Google map and it's got a toggle so you can make the old map disappear and see the new map underneath. So it allows you to understand like, for instance, like where is 95 in relationship to that old post road that I have my character on. Um, so David Rumsey, map collection and the geo referencer specifically is just an amazing thing that 
we have at our fingertips now. And you can do it all from home. <laughs> That's a beautiful thing. I know there's big pros and cons with all this virtual activity. Sure. Um, now, what I found with my research, um, doing the virtual research is amazing how many real videos you can watch about, like I just found one the other day um, looking for something um, to recommend to you. I have, actually haven't even watched it yet, but it's called the Canadian War, it's from the Canadian War Museum, and it's called One War, Four Perspectives on the War of 1812. So it's neat to be able to watch those and within 45 minutes, you've got an overview of the war. And then if you watch someone else's take on it, you get a different perspective. and. Um, so it's kind of a way to entertain yourself as well. And, and you know, with reading and reading and more reading, of course. Um, the other thing I found is these really amazing face, Facebook groups that have popped up that can be incredibly specialized. So I'm in some Facebook groups now with War of 1812 reenactors and, you know, all kinds of history buffs. And it's amazing the geek factor on there and like i met a woman there we've become friends and she makes life masks of the founding fathers so she and she loves james madison so she's been an amazing resource so really these facebook groups are very popular and can be very specialized and it's neat how whatever when you basically you know quote unquote meet the people who are on there and what they bring is just incredible. So I really enjoyed that. And another place I'd love to give to a plug for is a, um, a new virtual friend. Um, her name is Judith Kalora, and she has her own business called History at Play. And she does historical plays. Now she's on Zoom. She used to have like a bigger group, but she does different women. They're important, but often forgotten women in history. So she's got um, Christina McCullough from The Challenger. She's got Dolly Madison. She's got Rachel Revere. She's got um, Hedy Lamarr. I mean, she's got World War II uh, female uh, fighter pilots. And she does it every Friday night. And they're basically, you can, you can pay $5 or $25. And um, she's just amazing. She really is, her depth of knowledge on each of these women and their time period is just incredible. So I've really enjoyed that. And that's one of those where I feel lucky that I can watch those because it is on Zoom and it's, you know, it's not just somewhere in the Massachusetts area. So, um, so how about you, Jada? Yes, yeah, so the spring especially, uh, my site is, you know, geared towards parents, and so trying to help parents virtual school this year um, with, so I've tried to put together a lot of virtual tours for parents um, to help with their history um, homeschooling. So I found a lot of virtual sites, and one of my favorite was the Google Arts and Culture site. So it's, um, it's, Google has several different resources, and you can find all of these on my blog at thehistorymom.com, and if you just click on online resources, I have a huge list that I keep adding to when I come across something new, but at the Google Arts and Culture, you can search for a person or a place or a museum, and if, if there's a virtual tour available, it pulls it up, and all of the, the items that might be in the museum might be cataloged already on that site, so it's a really great place, kind of catch-all for all the museums or places you might be wanting to visit, so I highly recommend that. And then if you're missing your battlefield tours, being able to actually, nothing compares to being able to actually walk on a battlefield and feel like you're there stepping in history. But the American Battlefield Trust is a great online resource. They have a lot of virtual tours and um, even 360 um, kind of virtual tours where you really feel immersed in the battlefield. And their website is great. It has lots of maps and lots of information about Revolutionary War all the way through the Civil War. So I encourage you to take a look there. And then I found um, a lot of the homes, you know, you can't, even if the battlefields are open for walking, you can't really go inside places right now um, and a lot of these places like homes, historic homes. So a lot of these homes have actually taken advantage of YouTube. And so if you just simply Google and you, or look on YouTube, um, I found an amazing tours by the actual reenactors there at the um, Schuyler Mansion in Albany um, is one of my favorite ones. So, um, you, you know, that, don't, don't forget about YouTube. They have some great um, virtual tours there as well. Neat. Okay. Well, now we're going to talk about our favorite books to research with. Karen? I'm just going to tack on to what Jada said there too. Like if you, um, if you love some of these historic homes and places like that, that are 
Uh, you can't go inside of them, but like you were mentioning a few weeks ago, Libby, that you and your family went hiking at Montpelier, mm -hmm. James Madison's home, because they have a lot of hiking trails in and around these historic homes. So that, that's a really good way to get a feel for what the property is like without all the tours there too. Mm -hmm. It's kind of nice without being forced to take a tour and you can hike for free and get your exercise and still do some research at the same mm -hmm. time. As far as books, I have a little collection I'm going to hold up, but I also want to let you know that I'm on Pinterest at Karen at K A Chase author. Um, and I have a couple of book collections of books I used from my time period. Most of mine, of course, are revolutionary era, but I've got a couple that aren't. Um, this is one of my favorites. You talk about diaries and I noticed we have a question in the Q and A on diaries and we'll get to that in a little bit there, Pat. Um, but this is one of my favorites from this era, a narrative of a revolutionary soldier by Joseph Plum Martin. I was advised early on by one of the historians I talked to, a gentleman named Woody Holton. He said, this is like the definitive guide. Joseph Plum Martin was a very young man. He was like 16 when he got into the American Revolution and he somehow miraculously survived all seven years of the fighting that he was in. So he, later in life, he wrote a account of what it was like so you can pretty much follow the war from beginning to end from down on the ground from a very individual perspective so that's one of my favorites um and kind of reiterating what jada said why it's so important to look for those first-hand accounts even if they're written later some people are saying oh joseph plum martin was 70 when he wrote that but i don't know some of the stories that my grandparents told me when they were in their 70s were pretty remarkable um, as always with a time period, I, I think we get caught up on looking at battles and what men do. So here's Cokie Roberts, Founding Mothers. It's a really good primer if you want to find out how women contributed in the war from uh, manning cannons to sewing to you name it. Um, and it's not just the usual suspects of Abigail Adams. She's also in here. But so this is one of my favorites for the women's perspective. I think when, um, of course, there's mine, have to hold that one up again. It's just a requirement, right? But my book is about the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And I often get a lot of questions of like, so how would I find out about the signers? And so this is one of my favorites for the books. He's also got another one called um, Signing Their Rights Away about the men that signed the Constitution. But this is a book about all of the different players who signed the Declaration of Independence. And it's got a fabulous design, which I'm being in marketing um, up to now. I love the design of the book, but they have little bios of where the men were and when they signed it, and also kind of what happened to them after the war. So it's very accessible. And when you take apart the whole book, there's a copy of the Declaration of Independence on the inside of the actual cover. So it's very clever. And because this is also a writing and literary conference, I am including a book that I think was really valuable to me. I mean, I have a whole host of writing books that I use, The Writer's Journey being one of them. I even read, and I see it on Libby's shelf back there, Sid Field's um, book about writing screenplays. But this was one that I really loved that I think is was really valuable to me, reading like a writer. It really made me start to pick apart books a little bit differently. Um, it's one thing to read them through for joy, but another thing to read them for how they're structured, especially when it comes to fiction. And how, to, how fabulous is it her name actually is prose, right? Um, <laughs> so she's very well known, but um, e even if you're just a reader, it, it is really a wonderful book to understand how books are created. That's so neat. like I said, you can also go to uh, my Pinterest page and I have a whole collection of books I used in creating Caring Independence. And I have another Pinterest board that is um, loaded with characters and maps and location information. Neat. Um, I too am a big fan of uh, Cokie Roberts and I have, I have read this basically over and over and over again. And every time I read it, I learn more, but um, Ladies of Liberty about the early founding of the Republic. But basically with Cokie Roberts, you can't go wrong. And um, this is another one of my favorite books. It's called Petticoat Patriots. And um, maybe I just love it for the title, but it's a great book as well. 
And um, this is a wonderful one. Catherine Algor is another writer who you just can't go wrong with. She um, wrote this book called Parlor Politics, and it describes basically what Dolly Madison did of creating a um, sort of a social machine to further her, hundred, her husband's agenda in a time when women weren't allowed to be involved in politics. Um, and another one of my favorites, um, and the title just cracks me up because I am so not a seamstress kind of, kind of person, but um, No Idle Hands, The Social History of American Knitting. And this is just an example of what you can become interested in when you are really interested in your book. And if anyone had told me that I'd be excited when this arrived from Amazon, you, you know, I never would have believed you. So, um, and I keep finding that I just buy more and more books. And then I realize too, that the books don't actually read themselves, that you actually have to, to buying them is one thing and um, reading them is something else. But let me grab this, uh, let's see. This is another wonderful author. Um, her name is Carol Birkin. And um, she wrote a book also called Revolutionary Mothers. But um, she wrote this neat biography of another woman, kind of like that Rosalie Calvert person that I was telling you about. This, her name is Elizabeth Patterson Bonaparte. And I cannot believe this story isn't well known, that a, a young woman from Baltimore married Napoleon's youngest brother, Jerome, who is a um, lieutenant in the French Navy. And he had a little skirmish in the Caribbean and basically came to America to kind of hide out for a few months. And he was told that the most beautiful girls lived in Baltimore. And then he, so he came down to Baltimore and then he was told that the most beautiful girl was Betsy, Bona, Betsy Patterson. And he um, pursued her, they got married and um, it was this huge national sensation or worldwide sensation. And then Napoleon said, absolutely not. I did not tell you that you were allowed to marry her. I have other plans for you. And basically he abandoned her when she was six months pregnant. Um, but it's just this fascinating story. So um, Carol Birkin really brings it to life. But um, I do find with these author, Koki Roberts, Carol Birkin, once you read, and Catherine Elgor, once you read one of their books, it's like, you know, just bring them all on. They just do such a good job of bringing the life of the women to life, um, which, um, really is been discounted or disregarded for so long. So, um, and thankfully Carol Birkin's still alive. Yes. Yes. I wonder what she's working on now. No contributing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I find that every book I read has a little nugget that another book doesn't have. And, um, when I was reading about, when I was researching for Susanna's Midnight Ride and, um, I was reading all about how Colonel Tarleton left, the scene where um, Susanna met Lafayette and, and when Cornwallis arrived there were the soldiers and saw that Lafayette was gone, he sent Colonel Tarleton, you know, the bad, the evil man from the Patriot, um, sent him to Monticello to capture Jefferson. Well, there was one little tome that talked about how um, Jefferson was kind of dilly-dallying around and um, they even had a reenactment at at a Monticello and even they were, even the reenactors were making fun of him, offering the rider, you know, oh, would you like a glass of Madeira? And he's just patting around in his slippers. Well, that basically at the last minute, he looked out the door or out the window and he saw Tarleton coming in the, these dark green uniforms that they wore. And um, he scooted out the other door and he hid in the hollow of Carter's Mountain, which is where People bring their kids to go pick apples now. So, um, but I just saw it in that one little book. So you just never know these little tidbits that you're going to stumble across that just that one book will have. So um, that's fun because it just, those little tidbits for me really keep the uh, story interesting and, and make it more real and more human. So um, let's see. And do you guys have anything else to add? Yeah, well, I've got some books to add, and I totally understand the books not reading themselves because every time I visit a historical site, I tend to buy a book. And so when you go to multiple sites, you end up with a huge stack of books that you really intended to read. And then, so this is my year. I've declared it my year of historical reading. And I'm like, I'm getting through these. I've got a hundred, almost a hundred um, books from historical sites that I need to get through. So hopefully I'll get through part of them this year. Um, but I also echo what you all are saying about Cookie Roberts. She has a Civil War book 
um, about the women in Washington, D.C. during the Civil War called Capital Dames that I highly recommend. Um, it's a really interesting perspective but since Washington was so strategically located right at the the you know top of the the north very northern edge of the confederacy so it was always under threat of being attacked and so she does a really good job of talking about how this affected the women who were living there and it wasn't a, as well built a city as it is right now so it wasn't you know very as cosmopolitan as we think of it now and there are troops basically stationed in the capital and um, on the national mall so she has a is a really great book about that but my probably favorite book that i've used for research and i've used it since college so i went to college in south carolina and so mary boykin chestnut is um the person that the diary that if you're talking about the south during the civil war mary boykin chestnut was there so if she she was at the beginning of the war in charleston um, she came to richmond so she has tons of information here about the day-to-day -day life in richmond so i love reading her books because she's very a little bit catty and a little bit um, judgy and so you get a lot of the the flair that you um, want to hear about what when what was really happening back then that you might not get from uh, you know state academic novel or say state academic book so um, I really love her book and then this book I just recently start read it's called women's war and you can see a theme where I kind of like to focus on the women during these wars um, because I know that the the battles have been vastly covered many many times so the women, this book, The Women's War, does a really good job. She's a professor, um, I believe at Columbia, and um, she talks about what, what happened to the women, both free and enslaved women, during and immediately right after the Civil War. So I really recommend that book as well. And then um, we also um, have I've read a great book about Clara Barton. So that's a, a woman um, who really, you know, took on um, nursing on the battlefield, and then um, there's been some great books written about her. So I just recommend, um, my, also my favorite book is about, is called Liar, Temptress, Soldier, Spy. And it takes four women, two women from the North and two women from the South who served as spies and um, all kinds of uh, intrigue that happened during the war. So I really recommend those. And I have an Instagram um, um, feed where I really talk about the books that I'm reading or the books that I like. So feel free to check that out. And my blog, when I write about a historical site, I always give parents a, um, reading lists for their kids based on their kids ages of books that you can read either before or after your trip to enhance your visit so i really recommend taking a look if you're um you know looking for the civil war or any other um any other historical site take a look at my blog for those books as well it's great your blog is amazing yeah. with the resources and the, the restaurants yeah. nearby and everything else thank, <laughs> thank you <laughs> We should have included it in our research tips earlier on, like when you're researching, just check Jada's blog because <laughs> you know, you'll read ahead of time. And, you know. Find out everything, the opening hours, the closing hours. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. All right. Let's see. Do we have any, uh, we have a one question about. Um, yeah, we'll open it up to questions now. So drop yeah. in anything and we'll do our best to answer. Yes, there's a question about diaries. I've used them many times, but my most recent project is fairly contemporary and I'm using interviews and letters from people who may still be alive and elderly. Do you know of any legal requirements or complications other than citing the source? Many give no name, most give first name only, and some are traceable. Um, I would think it would be okay if you're just naming the source. Yeah, it doesn't I mean, like if there's somewhere that you found it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, if the person is alive and it's not really from a diary and it's from their story, it, it is good to kind of make sure that you have permission to include it. Um, but I, there's a rule, right? Like if they're dead and gone more than 25 years, it's open season. So it just, um, but it's, good to just check with the people that especially if they're still alive that you can use it but if it's written and it's got a copyright then you have to footnote it and you have to include it um or at least reference it right. do we have any other questions about how to research or how to how to manage writing historical fiction we can talk about that too because we have a little bit of time. 
And we could talk about our favorite um, different organizations like the Historical Novel Society is a great resource. Oh, right. That is fabulous. Yeah, we're both. Are you in that too, Jada? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, they're great. And their conferences are so good. And, and their next conference, is, thankfully, the conference is every other year. So they had their conference last June and then their next will next one it will be next june in san antonio so thankfully the pandemic hopefully won't affect that right we do have a question from mary helen sheriff how do you organize your notes oh, oh what mm. massive organization right? <laughs> i use scrivener i'm a I, I don't know how many of you you can say yes or no you don't have to um i use scrivener writing software and it allows me to keep all of my research notes right there but I also have physical journals that I take while I'm on a trip and I, I keep my notes in those. But I'm pretty fastidious. As yes, as you're, as you're, we call it, <laughs> but she's uh, Felix and I'm Oscar from The Odd Couple. I'm much more disorganized, um, but I do try to keep track of, you know, like I said earlier, I try to save the articles like the PDF, I'd save it and kind of put it in a folder. And um, I am, I definitely have lots of scraps of paper, but um, <laughs> I basically just kind of, I don't, I have all sorts of different things going on. Um, it, I guess the, the hardest thing is just figuring out what works for you, but the more organization you can provide, the better off you are of, you know, retracing um, you know, trying to find something later on. And I, so I keep, you know, notes I've already used and I have them in one binder and notes that I need to read and I want to incorporate, I keep in another binder and um, just try to keep things separated because it's so much more work to find something than if you just keep it organized to begin with. I've learned that the hard way, so. I'm a big fan of just the simple Google Docs just because, um, when you can when you're not at your own computer or you're on your phone and you're at a, a site and you want to write a note you can have that google doc that's available on every you know every device so i'm a big fan of just keeping track of things and um, on there so the whole google suite that's a good idea just to have everything on one um one document mm -hmm. Well, you know, well, and even just you can create a folder and have multiple documents, yeah. like, you know, your references and that way that it's all in one place and you can access it if you're not, you don't have your computer with you or, you know, if you're borrowing a friend's computer or something, it's, it's always available. Right. I but used to keep different done. like yeah. Word documents where I kept notes and then I just started to keep it all in one document because then I could search, you know, if, if I'm mm -hmm. doing you know, Battle of Bladensburg, I could just search for Bladensburg. And then basically I can go through the entire document and it's all on there. And then I kind of just whittle my way down, incorporate things or I realize, okay, well that's a repeat or, um, you know, and just delete it. And then I just, I can basically just keep walking, you know, going through mm -hmm. the same document. And then a lot of times too, I'll bold something. If I'm like, I like this fact, I don't have a home for it yet. So it's like, I just basically keep culling through and, and, um, trying to eliminate those. If I can't find a home, then just delete it. But if I can find a home, you know, put it where it needs to be. So I've learned too from this one of, even when I was in the note taking stage, I wish I had kind of kept it all together because I basically just was taking all notes and dumping them in there. But I do kind of wish I had at, at one point just had like Battle Baltimore document and then all that um, because I did have to spend a lot of time rearranging them at the end. Yeah, so, that is the beauty I mean, of Scrivener is that you can make folders right in the project that you're working on that are related to that and you can do a, a search throughout the whole thing. So it's, you know, for 45 bucks for Scrivener. There's a learning curve with Scrivener, obviously, because it's a different yeah. software, but um, I took the tutorials online to teach myself how to do it. And it because the massive book the three or 400 page Microsoft Word document, and then you're trying to edit. And I went through 12 different um, drafts of Caring Independence before wow. getting to the yeah. final one. So it would have been impossible. And I started out in Microsoft Word, but it ended up in Scrivener. Yeah, I mean, your book, yeah, it's, it's so much longer and so, uh, so many details and so many different scenes yeah. and locations and all that. I've heard wonderful things about Scrivener, and I just, haven't gotten myself to take the plunge and make myself do the tutorials. Yeah. Maybe I'll do that for my next book. 
Yeah, I hear that um, James River Writers is considering having a Scrivener um, class at their conference this fall. Oh, neat. Yeah, but that, that's a great organization too, you know, in terms of organizations mm -hmm. you mentioned is joining James River Writers here in Richmond. Um, they have over 500 members now and the number of people that are writing historicals or that are doing research, I mean, you can get tons of tips from people in that organization too. And they're doing a ton of stuff online. Right, and, and then their October conference is gonna be virtual this year. So online, anybody right. can join in, but yeah, it's a great resource. It really is. Yeah. For, yeah, all different, you know, types of writing in different levels as well. So, and self-publishing and um, traditional publishing. So yeah, that's a wonderful resource. I'll be doing a class this, um, this fall for their conference. I'll be doing a master class on marketing for authors. Oh, wow. I think I'm going to have to watch that one. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Yeah, unless you're and also, right. the amount of writing support from JRW is amazing. They are really a mm -hmm. fabulous organization. As well as 1455 is amazing, what Sean yeah. has managed to create out of nothing. Yeah, no kidding, right? This is and pretty great for season two. Yeah. Yes. Do we have any other questions? Uh, we're Let's see, I see there's... Got just a few minutes left. Um, Oh, good. Yeah, the amount of writers from JRW is amazing. It's very true. Oh, and Mary Helen, thank you. Helen, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Um, and we can always talk about how we got interested in history. I think that's a sure. you go first, yeah, but good. Well, I grew up in historic town of Kings Mountain, North Carolina, which was the site of a Revolutionary War battle. So I grew up going to the battleground and I was telling Karen and Libby the other day, my biggest memory is that Fer um, the Fer Ferguson, who was the British um, leader there, who died there at Kings Mountain from the Overmountain boys who um, he met his demise at, um, you still throw a rock on his grave when you do the walk <laughs> um, uh, on the battlefield there. So that's where I came from. And so um, history has always been something that I've loved. And, um, you know, I, I think back to, I think it's from growing up there. How about you, Libby? Um, I really was not much of a historian at all. Um, my husband used to laugh because I'd go to Williamsburg and go to the outlets and he'd say, you know, there's a whole <laughs> village there. And I'm like, well, you know, who needs to go that far? And you got J. Crew. But um, it really was when I learned about the story of Susanna Bowling and I thought the story was so fascinating of what she did that it really, I wanted to learn the history to kind of, um, find out whether the story was true. And then I just got totally swept away with the history and loved it to the point where I had editors say like, okay, stop researching. You just need to write the novel <laughs> part now. Um, Cause I just found so many hard to do. I wanted to share with people. And um, so it was really neat. I'm just discovering that all these historical figures are people and they're, you know, they had people they didn't like and people didn't like them and they had their little quirks and um, it makes it so much more interesting when you realize that they are just people with, you know, they had their wonderful qualities, but they also had their quirks as well. So, I mean, finding out that Thomas Jefferson was six foot three and red haired and his best friend James Madison was five foot four and a hundred pounds soaking wet and you think of them like walking down the hall together and how silly they must have looked. Um, so just, you know, and Thomas Jefferson was very anti-monarchy. So when he was president, he would just answer the front door of the White House wearing his slippers with holes in the toes. <laughs> that was his shtick. And he was like, you can sit wherever you want. And people were like in an uproar that he <laughs> had this open seating at dinners and, um, but, um, just hilarious, hilarious. Um, the, just learning about you know, in Hamilton obviously does a great job of that, of realizing all the inner squabbles and personality conflicts that went on. And I think that's why it's such a hit because you realize these are people and they all have their great qualities, but they all have their annoying qualities as well. So it's, um, it's, it's really fun. And I always use this analogy of pegs is if you're hanging up your winter coat on the wall and you don't have a peg there, it falls to the ground. And I didn't have any pegs for history. I didn't really know anything. So as I, at first it was cumbersome and then I had a couple of big pegs and then I had somewhere to hang the information. I had like a framework for it. And then it builds on that. And then you end up with more pegs, smaller pegs and you have somewhere to put the information. So, um, 
so it builds on itself. The more you and know, that's the more a good segue that. into answering Heather's question. Heather asks, when you're writing a book, do you find material that should be in a different or next book all the time, mm -hmm. all the time? I have um, sections in my shelf for next books with the books for those next books in them. And I finally got smart. I, you know, that there was this trend with designers where they would turn books around so that you saw the pages rather than the spines of the book. And so like I have a section over here where I see only the pages and that's not the book I'm supposed to be working on yet, but it's my little stash I can't get rid of. But um, yeah, Heather, I just, I keep like, every time I run into a bit of information and I think, oh, that should be in a different book. I also have a journal that is called my book of book ideas. And I make sure I go write down my book idea for the next book. So I know some authors are like, I just don't know what to write about. That is not my problem. I have a whole journal full of book ideas to move on to. So that's, awesome. that, that's a great idea. Yeah. And that did start, you know, I was a big history reader going back to your question earlier about like, how do we get into it? And I, traveled with my family in an RV every summer for eight to 10 weeks at a time when I was a kid. And I lived in Calgary is where I grew up, but we went all over the States. And so by the time I was 17, I'd been to 14 different or 44 different States and nine provinces. And my parents dragged us to just about every museum on the, in those 40 contiguous States. <laughs> So for me, it started that way. And then I was a voracious reader. I mean, I was reading Shogun at 15. Those big, fat history books to me were so fun. Um, Liz, you asked, do I mention, did I also mention that I keep charts as I research in order to take notes of the census? Yeah, and it's just a basic chart that I meant I made. Um, it has the list of the location where I am and the date kind of season that I was there and then who I met while I was there but then it has just the five senses with blocks so I can just write down my observations but as far as sound goes um the author Kathy Grissom she said she takes a tape recorder with her what well, you can do it on your phone now and she records the sounds of things around her and when she gets home and she's writing she plays the recording from where she's been I love that idea oh, that's brilliant that's really neat that's really neat. Well, it looks like we are out of time. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, reminder, all the programming is free, so attend any and all other panels of your choosing, and we will be putting videos of each session on our website. We'll be sending out e-surveys or surveys after the event, and we welcome your feedback. And finally, while we have endeavored to make this entire event free to everyone, it's not free to produce. If you like what you're experiencing and want to help us subsidize this in future events, please consider a tax deductible donation to via 1455litarts.org. Lit arts Every penny will help 1455 continue providing awesome, inclusive, and free programming. So thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good Thanks weekend, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.